Hello and welcome to Sparda Lines, your one stop destination for the civil services preparation, UPSC, KPSC, and other relevant examinations. Today, we have picked up a couple of important articles from the Hindu which are very significant from your UPSC and your KPSC examination point of view. Before we understand what today's articles are in greater detail, a quick gentle reminder. As you all know, we have been conducting a test series for those of you who have been preparing for CTI, PDO and the KS examination. The fourth test as part of this test series will be conducted on 17-12-2023 and this test will be completely free. For those of you who are planning to take up it on the offline as well as on the online mode, this is the best opportunity for you all to understand what are the kind of questions that can be anticipated, how this exam entirely works and for those of you who have to understand how to eliminate the options as well, we will be recording these videos and will be coming up with the same as well. So please do tune in and also subscribe to our YouTube channel and also to this test series. Let's look into the first article. The first article says, Article 370 judgment is a case of constitutional monism. The author here is speaking about the recent decision given by the Supreme Court of India with respect to Article 370. Before we understand what this article is in greater detail, let me give you a background as to what did the Supreme Court of India say. The Supreme Court of India has upheld the decision of the Government of India basically to dilute Article 370 of the Indian Constitution. What is this Article 370 of the Indian Constitution? Article 370 of the Indian Constitution happens to be a temporary provision which is mentioned in fundamental which is mentioned in part 21 of the Indian Constitution. What is this Article 370? Why did it come into existence? Why was it introduced into the Indian Constitution in the first place? We have to go back to the history books. When we look into the history of India immediately after independence and prior to the independence, what we had was princely states in India. We had as many as 555 princely states in India. So the government of India back then, which was under the control of the British India, basically said that we will be giving you an option, an option to join India or an option to join Pakistan or you can also stay independent as well. So the dominion of India was the option given to the princely states or you could join Pakistan or you can also stay independent as well. All the princely states, majority of them became part of India. But then there were three states or three princely states which wanted to stay independent. One was Hyderabad. Second was Junagadh, third was the state of Jammu and Kashmir. What happened with respect to Hyderabad? In Hyderabad, it was the rule of the Nizam. Nizam wanted to take control of the state of Hyderabad and ultimately he said he would want to stay independent. At this particular moment of time, he also had his private army in the form of Razakas. They imposed a lot of violence into the state of Hyderabad and ultimately Hyderabad had to enter into a state where people were wanting to stay with India but the Nizam wanted to stay independent as well and he also enforced his private army there was a large scale bloodshed as well at this particular moment it was Vallabhai Patel G's iron hand and he introduced the police action in the form of Operation Polo so immediately after Operation Polo Hyderabad becomes part of India Nizam is asked to leave India as well that's the first part second part happens to be Junagadh when you look at Junagadh where was it it is in Gujarat and it happens to be a part in Gujarat. So in Junagadh, again the king wanted to merge with Pakistan. So when you look into this entire region, people wanted to stay with India. They wanted to be part of India, but then it was only the king who wanted to merge himself with Pakistan. This did not happen. Why? Because the people of Junagadh wanted to stay with India and ultimately a consensus was derived and then Junagadh became part of India. That's the second part. The third happens to be Jammu and Kashmir. When it comes to Jammu and Kashmir, what exactly happened? We have Raja Hari Singh. Raja Hari Singh, who was present during that particular period of time, wanted to stay independent and he wanted to stay independent and he continued with this action as well. 
at that particular period of time there were non state actors who were pushed in by pakistan to jammu and kashmir so jammu and kashmir wanted to stay independent he also wanted to govern the state of jammu and kashmir during that period of time but then pakistan introduced non state actors into jammu and kashmir so raja hari singh was caught by surprise he felt that i wanted to stay independent but then there are non state actors who are coming and interfering in the state of jammu and kashmir there was again a large scale violence and they did not have the army of their own at this particular moment raja hari singh entered into a treaty of accession with the indian government wallabhai patel said that yes we are ready to safeguard and protect the rights of the people of jammu and kashmir but what is it for india so it is at this particular moment he signed the treaty of accession which basically meant that there were three powers which were given to the government of india which were these three powers one is communication second is defense third happens to be the external sector so c d e is what you have to remember so we have communication second happens to be defense third happens to be the external sector these three aspects of jammu and kashmir was given to the indian government which meant that indian government will ultimately have control over these three aspects but rest of the aspects will be under the sovereign control of the king which happens to be raja hari singh so what did he say he said that we be from the state of jammu and kashmir will be giving these three powers to the indian government when you consider other princely states we have what is called as the treaty of accession and we also have something called as the treaty of merger when it comes to the state of jammu and kashmir the treaty of accession was signed but the treaty of merger was not signed at all which means only these three powers were given to india but rest of the powers was with the king who happened to be the sovereign entity of the state of jammu and kashmir when it comes to the other princely states in india there was complete merger it was complete merger with the union of india but when it comes to the jammu and kashmir what exactly happened it is at this particular killer moment that he gave only three powers because they were non state actors but rest of it was held under the sovereign power of the king while well, all of this was happening because there was non state actors who entered into the picture these non state actors were interfering that is when india did not want to continue with the war there were two viewpoints here one was the viewpoint of jawahar lal nehru the other was the viewpoint of vallabhai patel what was the viewpoint of jawahar lal nehru he did not want to take up the war because the world had already seen a lot of colonialism and there was already a lot of bloodshed as well at this particular moment jawahar lal nehru felt we did not want any war with pakistan so he said we have to go to united nations and ultimately this was the consensus that was developed and we went to united nations during this period in the united nations what exactly happened the state of jammu and kashmir they said will have to go into a status quo mode what was the status quo mode that you had the non state actors few non state actors which are controlled by pakistan these non state actors have to pull off from pakistan these non state actors have to pull off from jammu and kashmir so they had captured a certain part of jammu and kashmir withdraw these people from the state of jammu and kashmir and at the same time india also had its military force because raja hari singh had asked for it so india also had to pull off its military strength and what did the united nations say as long as this is not done plebiscite will not be held in jammu and kashmir so united nations said that it is the people of jammu and kashmir who will decide what their destiny ultimately will be it is the people of jammu and kashmir will decide whether they have to go with pakistan whether they have to go with india whether they have to stay independent it will be decided by the people of jammu and kashmir and ultimately a plebiscite will have to continue said united nations however the non state actors in pakistan did not withdraw and at the same time india as raja hari singh requested he, they wanted to maintain a certain level of military in the jammu and kashmir while all of this have was happening india did say that yes united nations has said that we have to give respect to the people of jammu and kashmir so what did india say india said that we will have a temporary provision in our constitution whereby we will give this power to the state of jammu and kashmir where they can create their own constituent assembly and ultimately frame their own constitution 
to understand and bridge the differences and create a constitution of their own and this temporary provision which was inserted into Indian constitution is article 370 which was basically introduced at that particular period of time as a temporary provision basically to allow the people of Jammu and Kashmir their constituent assembly to create a relationship between India as well as Jammu and Kashmir. So why was article 370 introduced it was for a period of transition what was a period of transition united nations said that this particular idea of people of jammu and kashmir will have to create their own framework so during this period while a transition was to take on article 370 was introduced as a temporary provision where people of jammu and kashmir their constituent assembly will create their own they will decide the relationship between india and jammu and kashmir so there was a transition period from which the state of jammu and kashmir will ultimately integrate with india they will decide what is the relationship with jammu and kashmir and india and this was a period where 370 was introduced a transition period a temporary period until the people of jammu and kashmir decide what relationship they want to hold with the people of the country we need one article which is able to integrate which is able to allow us to speak to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and that article is 370 of the Indian Constitution so article 370 of the Indian Constitution basically is that particular window or a road or a means or a channel for us India Indian Constitution to flourish in the Jammu and Kashmir so what was this 370 370 was basically a temporary provision a transitional provision which was introduced into Indian Constitution basically as a ways and the means and the channel for us to integrate with Jammu and Kashmir so when we speak about article 370 it is a temporary provision when we look at article 1 of the indian constitution it speaks about india it defines with what part of what is india and it also speaks about seven schedule as well which ultimately says that jammu and kashmir is an integral part of india that's the first point so what was 370 370 was basically one of the transitional parts that was present temporarily and ultimately we had the constituent assembly which was formed the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir did come up with its own constitution as well and it came up with its constitution and ultimately the constituent assembly should have decided what was the status of article 370 but it did not decide what was the status of article 370 and ultimately like all constituent assembly the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir came to an end without deciding on article 370 it came to an an end so many people assume that we have article 370 which has taken permanent feature why permanent feature that is because the constituent assembly did not speak about article 370 then it did not ask for deletion of the article 370 it ultimately meant that article 370 has acquired a permanent feature that is where we have to look at article 370 what does article 370 of the indian constitution say it says temporary provisions with respect to the state of jammu and kashmir what does it highlight it says temporary provisions now when you look at article 370 uh, sub clause 3 notwithstanding anything foregoing in the provisions of this article the president may by public notification declare that this article shall cease to be operative or shall be operative only with such exceptions and modifications and from such day as he may specify provided that the recommendation of the constituent assembly of the state referred to in clause 2 shall be necessary before the president issues such a notification what does this emphasize article 370 was a temporary provision article 1 of the indian constitution was applicable to the state of jammu and kashmir this is where the indian constitution will be applicable to the state of jammu and kashmir only with the acceptance and the permission of the constituent assembly so let's say for example we have the fundamental rights of the indian constitution is it directly applicable to the to the people of jammu and kashmir no why because only 
communication, then defense and external affairs is directly applicable. For the rest of the other for the rest of the other sections that had to be adopted to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, what you required was a presidential order. So if we had the presidential order, the presidential order could be taken up by the president and only after the consent was issued by the constituent assembly of Jammu and Kashmir, which ultimately means that you have the legislative assembly. If the legislative assembly gives permission, a presidential order is invoked. That is when certain aspects of Indian constitution would be applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So we have the union list, we have the state list, we have the concurrent list. Who can make laws for the state list? It is the state subject matter. State of Jammu and Kashmir would be able to make the laws. Who can make laws for the concurrent list? It is the state of Jammu and Kashmir who will be able to make the laws. Who can make laws for the union list as well? It is the state of Jammu and Kashmir. If a certain subject matter which is present in the union list, if they had to make a law, then presidential order was required. So presidential order is required for them to actually enforce a certain right which is present in the Indian constitution. For the election commission to operate in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, presidential order is required for the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir to accept the fundamental rights presidential order is required for the directive principles of the state policy to operate presidential order is required for everything that we have in the Indian constitution to make it applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir what was required article 370 was required what was required presidential order was required so article 370 was the means and the ways and the channel through which India was able to operate its constitution to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Originally, only communication, defense and external sector was operational. But for the rest of the other parameters and other subject matter to operate in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, this 370 and the presidential order became the ways and the means as to which how we could actually implement this particular order. This also meant that 370 was acting as a channel from India towards the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This ultimately meant that for every presidential order that was issued by the president, it also meant that the concurrence and the consent of the constituent assembly and the legislative assembly of Jammu and Kashmir was required. This is where the entire narration happened. So what does it mean? That we have many aspects, many subject matters of union list, which was ultimately implemented for the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And at the same time, when you look at the keen wordings of the 370, what does it mean? It means that we have Article 370, which also had a self-destructive clause in itself. What is the self-destructive clause? It says that the president can declare that this article shall cease to be operative. So to be to seize this article, which means entire constitution of India to be made applicable, the president can declare that this particular article will cease to be operative, which means as of now, what we are taking is a piecemeal approach. We have the fundamental rights. We have the directive principles of the state policy. If it has to be implemented in the uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir, this will require the permission of the constituent assembly. If they have to implement about the Supreme Court, if they have to speak about the election Commission or the Union Public Service Commission for everything public for everything presidential order has to be given and ultimately the constituent assembly and the legislative assembly had to accept it there was a one by one step one step at a single time so in order to ensure that entire constitution of India is implemented in the state of Jammu and Kashmir what should the president do the president shall issue a notification which means that the entire constitution of India is applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and ultimately they also will have to say that if this has to come into picture this article 370 should be completely removed that is what the 2019 on August 5th we had that is where we had the president of India who came up with the presidential order who said that the entire state of that the entire constitution will be applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So what did they make use of? They made use of article 367 of the Indian constitution. This is where the interpretation clause is present in the Indian constitution. This interpretation clause ultimately meant that we have the constitution of India which is interpreted in a certain way. 
when we go back to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, we did not have the government during that particular period of time. Why? Because the legislative assembly was dissolved. So when you look into the legislative assembly, since it was dissolved, what we had? We had the state of Jammu and Kashmir. When it comes to the state of Jammu and Kashmir and its own constitution during that period of time in 2019, what we had was a governor's rule that was in place. So the governor's rule was present for about six months. After the governor's rules was present, immediately what we have is the president's rule. So during a president's rule, as you all know, we have two parts that we have to consider. Who will consider the executive role? It is the president. Whenever we speak about the president, who will take place? What happens during a president rule? We will have is the president who will become the executive person and it is through the governor all the actions will be performed. Who will take care of the legislative business? It is the parliament. Let's say for example, the president rule has to be enforced in the state of Maharashtra. In that particular place, the executive role will be taken up by the president. The legislative role will be taken up by the parliament. What happened in the state of Jammu and Kashmir? In the state of Jammu and Kashmir, governor's role was replaced by the president rule. So who will take up the executive action? It is the president. Who will take up the legislative action? It is the parliament. So at this particular moment, moment 367 an interpretation was done which said that we do not have the constituent assembly so since the constituent assembly is dissolved it is equivalent to the legislative assembly why because 367 an interpretation was done so what we have was the constituent assembly constituent assembly is not present so we have the legislative assembly so this legislative assembly is not present why because at that particular period of time we did not have the legislative assembly so who had the power it is the president who had the power if it is the president it is the executive approach but then we have the legislative approach which will be taken up by the parliament since the parliament has given the permission ultimately it means that the president has taken the consent of the recommendation of the constituent assembly which means legislative assembly since the legislative assembly means that it is the parliament it has taken the permission of the parliament and ultimately 370 stands diluted which means only one that is this provision or par this provision that Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India will stand but rest of it is suspended is what happened on August 5, 2019. With this, we had the creation of Jammu and Kashmir as a union territory, separate union territory of Ladakh was created and ultimately the 370 was diluted temporary provision was completely eliminated and the entire constitution of India was applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This means that the entire state of Jammu and Kashmir will now have all aspects of Indian constitution applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This is when it went to the Supreme Court of India. So Supreme Court was asked a question, is this right? Why? Because originally it was temporary provision which had also acquired permanency in nature. So is this way of changing this entire state to a union territory, is it right was what was asked before the Supreme Court of India. This decision was what was given by the Supreme Court of India recently where the Supreme Court of India has said that whatever the government has said and whatever the government has done is also right. How did the Supreme Court decide on it? The Supreme Court decided on it on the basis of three questions. We have Raja Hari Singh, the Ernstweld ruler of princely state, he issued a proclamation that he would retain his sovereignty. His successor Karan Singh issued another proclamation that the Indian constitution would prevail over all other laws in the state. So it was Raja Hari Singh, subsequently it was Raja Karan Singh. Karan Singh accepted that Indian constitution is applicable to the state of Indian, to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. In essence, it had an effect of merger like every other princely state that joined India. The court ruled and this emphatically concluded Jammu and Kashmir has always been an integral part of India. CJ Chandrachud cited section 3 of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution itself apart from article 1 and 370 of the Indian constitution. So in article 3 of the Jammu and Kashmir it said that the state of Jammu and Kashmir is and shall be the integral part of union of India. The state's constitution also provided that this provision cannot be amended and that is why this particular provision is not temporary in nature. It is permanent 
permanent which means the state of Jammu and Kashmir is permanent in nature and is part of India and all aspects of Indian constitution is now applicable to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Second is the article 370 a temporary or a permanent provision. It is a temporary provision that is because Raja Hari Singh has said so and the wordings of the Indian constitution and also the Jammu and Kashmir constitution says so because it is placed in part 21 of the Indian constitution which speaks about the uh, temporary provision which is why this entire exercise has only pro temporary provision and not permanent feature said the Supreme Court of India. Third, this question relating to effective abrogation of Article 370, the Supreme Court upheld both presidential proclamations of August 2019. Apart from the larger federal issues and the debate, the special status of Jammu and Kashmir, the key legal challenge was to two presidential proclamations in 2019. So, the court upheld both the proclamations including the one that gave a new meaning to the constituent assembly of Jammu and Kashmir as legislative assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. So, it has upheld the decision of the government of India and what did the court say? The court said that when it comes to the temporary or permanent feature, it is only temporary feature and when it comes to the sovereignty, it is the sovereignty of India and not the sovereignty of Jammu and Kashmir and it also said that this is one such example of asymmetric federalism and there is nothing unusual or symmetric federalism. So, what is this asymmetric federalism? That there are some special features in the Indian constitution. For example, if you look at article 371 it has couple of features that is given to couple of states for example 371 j which speaks about the hyderabad karnataka region has some special features similarly there are some special features for the state of nagaland so on and so forth since there are these aspects that are features that are given to specific states jammu and kashmir also had some feature and now the entire constitution of india is applicable to the state of jammu and kashmir and ultimately Jammu and Kashmir is an integral part of India, will continue to be integral part of India, said the Supreme Court of India. So, the author in this particular case goes on to say that this decision of the Supreme Court of India is a case of constitutional monism. So, the author goes on to say ideally this fundamental principle of federalism should have been respected which the Supreme Court has not done in the instant case is one of the viewpoints of the author. But the major discussion is about the Supreme Court of India's judgment. Now, let us look into the next article. This article says, Speaker calls for security review of new parliament. This article here is speaking about the security breach that has surfaced in parliament. Whenever we speak about parliament, we also know for the fact that it is the temple of Indian democracy. It represents the power authority of the Indian democracy. It represents the rights of the people's democracy. It represents the representation of India is present in the parliament of India. So, if you've gone to the parliament of India, there is a very strict regime that is present in the form of uh, strict regulations when it comes to checking protocol security so on and so forth you will be frisked in number of gates and you will also be asked not to bend when you are in the gallery if you've gone to the parliament you're not supposed to bend in front why that is because it's a security protocol you're not supposed to even take anything in your pocket because that's a security protocol but what happened recently in parliament was there were cans that were taken and gas was fumed in the hall of the parliament this ultimately meant that was the security breach in the parliament so this article here is primarily saying that if such security breaches continue or is present in the parliament of india it raises couple of concerns as well how did people enter into the parliament with such cans how were they able to spray gas in the parliament within the closed wall or the well of the parliament how were they able to enter how were they not able to how were the security apparatus not able to see or even capture this how were the security apparatus not keen on making sure that this person does not enter and that is where the author says that there was security breach with respect to the parliament security overview. Apart from this, we have something called as the visitor's pass. What is this visitor's pass? This visitor's pass is a pass that is given to a person who can come and sit in the gallery and would be able to see the proceedings of the house. What would happen? Let's say for example, there is an MP. 
the MP would have the permission to allow a certain person to come and see what is happening in the in the parliament. So what would be given? The MP would say that he knows so and so person and ultimately a pass would be given to this individual. So this pass once it is given, they would have to show this pass in the secure to the security apparatus and they would be allowed to be seated in the gallery. And once they are seated in the gallery, they should have a strict rules that they have to follow. They should not carry anything with themselves. They are not supposed to bend as well because there would be parliamentary proceedings that will be taking place. So there are certain protocols that are also present. So a visitor pass would be given by the member of the parliament and the member of the parliament says that this person is known to the member of the parliament. They would know who this person is. It is a friend or it can also be a person whom they know and ultimately this pass would be given to the individual and this individual will go to the gallery and will watch the proceedings of the parliament. But in this instance, MP had given pass to one of the individuals. They had put up a can in their shoes which was specially designed and ultimately they sprayed the can and there was a lot of issues when it comes to the parliamentary proceedings. Therefore, there was an adjournment for a specific period of time and then after a considerable period of time, since these individuals who jumped into the wall of the parliament within the well of the parliament were superseded and they were overthrown by the security apparatus. So this ultimately means that we will have a commission which will be appointed. This commission will look into why this breach has occurred and ultimately recommendations will also be made and these recommendations will also be implemented. In the past, there have also been similar such circumstances as well, where on May 5th, 1994, a visitor calling himself as Prem Pal Singh Samrat, son of Balaji Lal, jumped from the visitor's gallery into the chamber of the Lok Sabha and attempted to shout slogans. Samrat had made a statement and expressed regret for his action. He was issued a warning, stern warning on the rising of the house and was also released. Subsequently, we've had another one on August 24, 1994, where one Mohan Patak son of Gargovind Singh jumped down to the visitor's gallery into the Lok Sabha and shouted slogans according to the facts of the case, according to the digest of the cases. And then he was also imposed with penalty and was also thrown behind bars as well. So it is not the first time that it is occurring. It has also occurred in the past as well. So commissions will be appointed. This commission will look into it where exactly there was a security flaw and ultimately they will make a recommendation and this recommendation will be implemented by the government of India. But despite all of this, there has been a security breach. This means that there has been an attack on the temple of democracy. There has been a uh, security flaw, security breach, and this has to be rectified going forward is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says, how will election boycott by BNP affect Bangladesh? This article here is speaking about the elections in Bangladesh. Let us understand in brief what is this article all about. When it comes to the political parties in Bangladesh, what we have is the Awami League. One which happens to be a major political party. The other also happens to be the BNP which stands for the Bangladesh National Party. When it comes to the Awami League, it is that political party which has been there since uh, independence. It is this Awami League which is right now in power and then we have another national political party in Bangladesh which happens to be the BNP or the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. The Awami League happens to be very close to India. In fact, there are a number of insurgents who are present in uh, Bangladesh. These insurgents are the insurgents who have been operating in India, now present in Bangladesh. If at all there is a security breach, India has been able to get the support of Bangladesh because Awami League has been very close to India as well. So whenever there is an insurgent group or let's say for example, there is one of the agencies or a group which is fighting against India. In that case, it is this particular political party which is able to help India dethrone this insurgent group hand over to India. So Awami League has been very close to India. 
there is another political party by the name of BNP, which is the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. The Bangladesh Nationalist Party is another national party which is present in Bangladesh. But when it comes to India's relationship, it has been peculiarly against India. Why? Because this particular political party frames or drafts itself or personifies itself or shows and exemplifies itself as a radical party which is representing a specific religion of its own. Since it happens to be a radical party representing one of the specific radical form of a religion, it is against India. So when it, this is the general background to it. Now what is happening? We have the Awami League which has been in power for a very long period of time. This Awami League currently says that it will be coming up with the elections. But then BNP which happens to be the Bangladesh National Party party is saying that it is not going to participate in these elections. Why? Primarily because it feels that the elections are not conducted in a neutral manner and it is taken over by the government and ultimately there could be a possibility of government taking over the power once again. There will not be elections run on a neutral way and which is why it is not contesting the elections. Which is why the BNP says it will not be contesting the elections. However, the Sheikh Hasina government has clarified that the international observers can come over to Bangladesh, see and exercise their right and ultimately confirm if everything is happening as per the neutrality and the general principles of law. So she has requested the international community to come over and also encounter this entire exercise. United States of America and European Union have put increasing pressure on Bangladesh to hold free and fair elections as well. This is where you have Russia and China who have now said that United States of America should stop meddling with the affairs of the democratic principles of another country. So what we have is a clash and a friction and a tussle between two major political parties in Bangladesh to conduct the elections in a free and fair manner. And that is what this article is all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says India is vulnerable to climate change induced health issues. So this article here is primarily speaking about the health issues that may surface because of the climate change factors. What are these climate change factors? Let's say for example, we have increasing drought like condition or excessive heat waves that are present, increasing cyclones that are present. We have monsoon which is very abrupt as well, flood like situations that are created and for those regions where rainfall should not occur, it is occurring. For those where rainfall should occur, it is not all occurring. June is where the monsoon occurs but then there is a delay in which where the monsoon reaches India. All this is due to because of climate change. Added to it, because of climate change, there are also health related parameters as well. Let's say for example, longer exposure to the pollution related factors, we, in, uh, we take in particulate matter 10 and we also take in particulate matter 2.5, which ultimately results in the respiratory issues. And the Supreme Court has also clarified for those people who are not even smokers, they do not even smoke. It is a toxic air which is also polluting and spoiling the health of the people of Delhi because it is like a gas chamber inhaling toxic air because of the pollution will also mean that people will live less in the state or in the union territory of Jammu in the union territory of Delhi and ultimately it has concluded that this climate change is also increasing health related parameter. So whenever there are increasing cases of health related parameters, people will have to shell out extra money. Why? That is because they have been hit with a health related issue. So they have to spend their own money and some of them also become poor as well because of the climate change related induced health related factor. So this article primarily goes on to say that with private with climate change ramifications that are existing, this will have a significant and direct impact on the health and people will have to spend extra in order to come out of this health related matter is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says road fatalities in India despite global drops is World Health Organization. So this article says road traffic deaths fell by 5% to 1.19 million annually worldwide between 2010 and 2021 
with 108 United Nations member countries reporting a drop. So, the total number of road and traffic fatalities in India went up to 1.54 lakh in 2021 from 1.34 in 2010 and the global status road report on Road Safety 2023. The country is succeeding in reducing road traffic deaths by over 50% and this includes Belarus, Brunei, Denmark, Japan, Lithuania, Norway, Russian Federation, Trinidad and Tobago, so on and so forth. And as of 2019, road crashes were the leading cause of deaths among children and youth aged 5 to 29 years and were the 12th leading cause of deaths where all agents were considered and two-thirds of the deaths occurred among people of a working class. Again, this article is factual in nature, so kindly go through these articles as well. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. So, if you are liking these initiatives, please do like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and also share it with your other fellow aspirants as well. This is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.